We bless yes, you. Yes, God. We are going to have a good time. Yes, Bishop Lord. has a word from us, for us, yes, Lord, yes. and we're going to worship and be in God's presence and be in just invoked and Hallelujah. invoke him to be Hallelujah. with us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. So this is a song we do a lot, so I'm going to have everybody be clapping with us. We're going to sing together as a family. Amen. All right. Sing, oh, give thanks, oh, oh give, give thanks, thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, Let's do that again. Sing, oh, give thanks, oh, give thanks unto the unto Lord, the Lord oh, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Sing, oh, to receive a blessing 
from you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We are expecting a blessing from you this yes, morning. God. So our hands are lifted up yes, and our hearts are ready to receive. Hallelujah. My hands are lifted up. Yes, My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. We are ready to receive it, oh God. Hallelujah. A blessing from you. Yes, God. Oh, sing my hands. My hands are lifted up. My heart is ready. My heart is ready to receive. A blessing from you. A blessing from you. Come on, let's worship God in this place. God, we're ready to receive a blessing from you. from you. God, we're ready to receive a blessing. A blessing Come on, let's do that one you. more time. Oh, sing my hands. My hands are lifted up. God, my heart is ready. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. A blessing from you. God, to receive a blessing, a blessing from you. Oh, say break me, make me, break me, make, shake me, shake, mold me. My heart is ready. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. A blessing from you. God, we're ready to receive. A blessing, a blessing from you. Oh, say break me, make me, break me, make, shake me, mold me. My heart is ready. My heart is ready to receive. A blessing from you, oh God. We're ready to receive a blessing. A blessing from you. Come on and say, my hands are lifted up. My hands are lifted up. My heart is ready, yes. My heart is ready to receive. A blessing from you, oh God. Oh, we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. A blessing from you. to receive a blessing, a blessing from you, a blessing, a blessing, a blessing from, a blessing from you. If you're ready to receive that blessing, let's declare, we're ready to receive a blessing from you, oh, a blessing, a blessing, a blessing from you, hallelujah.
Good morning. Praise God. Old Testament scripture comes from Psalms 133, 1 through 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for uh, brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of the garment. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We praise God for this day. This is exciting, and I'm here to do the prayer. So, Father God, we thank you for this day, and we bless you because you're so good to us. We invoke your presence this morning that you would bless God, those that will be listening, those that will be partaking with us, that you would bless us, God, to receive from you. Our hearts are ready to receive, God. We open up ourselves to you, that you might bless us today, God. Whatever we stand in need of, we're open and we're saying, here we are, God. Have your way, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We are those who are here. We can clap our hands. And those who are on Facebook, clap, 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 clap your hands. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are so glad in it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We want to welcome you to True Vine Church. Amen. Our Sunday worship service. All right. Those who are on True Vine, those who are on Facebook, go ahead and like and share this page. Put those emojis in. Put some comments in. Let them know that we are live and we are getting ready to bless the Lord. The presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you know that he's good? Hallelujah. He woke us up this morning. We got something to thank God for. They said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I praise the Lord today. I praise the Lord today. There's some people who wish they could open their mouths and praise them. Well, we got a chance. Let's make sure we are giving God praise and we're giving glory. Amen. Prepare your hearts and minds as we get ready to hear the word of God. Amen. We're going into part two from what Bishop has spoken last Sunday. I tell you, it is going to be a blessing. Have your notepads and those who are not getting the chat, just put some comments in what you hear and what you're amen to. Go ahead and do that because we believe in God has a word for you that would encourage you and empower you, that would uplift you. So we thank God for those who are here and those who are on Facebook. Go ahead and clap as you receive, we present to some and introduce to others our own bishop, Bishop Trevor D. Alexander, a man of God that loves God and is called into our season such as this. Amen. 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 I hope you're ready to hear what the Lord has to say to us today. We're going to greet everybody that's tuned in today on our Facebook page, 
thank you, thank you, thank you. There are so many other places you could have stopped, but you stopped on our page. So we thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you. If you're listening to me and you're on our Facebook page, put something in, the, in that comment, comment box and say, listen, I'm listening, I'm ready. They say that, I'm listening, I'm ready. No. All right. You're not on Facebook, y'all. <laughs> okay, do now. Yeah. Okay. If you're if you're on Facebook, <laughs> so I'm listening and I'm ready. <laughs> but everybody in here is listening and they're ready. <laughs> listen, listen. Uh, while we're here, well, if you are listening, and you, there's so many ways you can give. Right, we talked about it this morning in Sunday school. There's so many ways you can give, and your giving keeps us being mission friendly. We are still giving to CASA, we're still giving to uh, Mission Edge Division, to the Feed Food Bank and Feed the Children. There's so many places that we give and support, and we have continued doing that all throughout this pandemic. And the only reason we can do that is because you support us, we can support others. So if you haven't done so already, um, now if you're in, in the building, now there's a box on the wall over there, just fill out, a, fill out a envelope, or you can put it straight in cash, just put it in that box right there. Yeah, if, you, if not, the usher will come by and get it and put it in the box for you. Amen. And if you are at home, we got ush, ushers. If you're at home, you can give through PayPal. Go, you can go on our fa Facebook, no, excuse me. We can do, you can still give through Facebook? Yes, we can. Okay. This, we can hit that button still, right? Yes. <laughs> Amen. You can go through um, PayPal. You can go on our website and go through PayPal. You can use a 54244. Um, you can use the Cash App, which is True Vine Church. No, just True Vine, right? Dollar sign. I keep saying about dollar sign. Also, that's like a gimme. Dollar sign, true vine essay. There's so many different ways you can give. So if you're not comfortable um, using the old fashioned cash and checks, go on good electronic. Either way you give, either way, we will be appreciated and it will be put to good use. Amen. Lord, she says, Elder, Elder Tanya Grant is in the house. Uh, praise God. With a grandbaby? Lord Jesus, everybody's getting grown now. All right, amen. We want to say thank you to everybody that came here. It's a lot cooler this week amen. Amen. Woo! Amen. than last week. Now, the, the fact that I'm sweating don't mean nothing. I sweat anyway. I sweat anyway. But um, I got to thank my nephew, Sean, who came in last week and, and, and Deacon came down and worked on us. Yeah, amen. They came in when it was sweltering heat and fixed it. And he's going to come back and do some maintenance on that. Say amen. Yeah. And Pastor, Pastor Jeff and Deacon Piper and Michael, and all, all, and all the media folks, they came down, got them together. Deacon, Deacon, Deacon John Piper is working so hard. <laughs> he came down and when he pouring down with sweat, Lord Jesus, I, I appreciate everything y'all do to make us look good um, when we come and go live. So thank you. All right, y'all ready for the word? Amen. I just saw the, um, the Burgesses. <laughs> Good to see. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I got to say this, that today is Tasha's last Sunday uh, as a resident of San Antonio. Yes. So next time you see her, she'll be a resident of, of Houston. Yes. So man, praise God, praise God. And uh, Dr. Cross, I'm assuming this is your sister, right? Oh, your mother, okay. <laughs> Good to see you, mother. <laughs> Amen, praise God. All right, y'all ready for the word? Amen. All right, from the same scriptures from last week, um, if you have not seen it yet, go to our YouTube page and tune in, and you can get last week's message. So this is Healing at the Table, part two. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 to 18, and Matthew 20, uh, 26, verse 26 to 30. If you have the Bibles, if you need the Bibles, we still have Bibles, y'all. Uh, we still have Bibles. Thank God for, for Bibles. But I know many of us have brought your own Bibles, and some of us are using those electronics to do what we do. It is Matthew 26, verse 17 to 18. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 30. All right, y'all ready? 
I heard one amen. Amen. Okay, then. And listen, I'm, we're back in church now. Y'all can talk back to me. <laughs> I used to imagine y'all talking back to me. And good to see Brother Michael on the keys. Amen. Amen. Pretty soon we get all everybody back and we get a full array. But we thank God for you coming with us today. Amen. All right. Matthew 26, verse 17 says, And now this is the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The disciples came to Jesus and saying to him, Where do you want to, us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city and a certain man and say to him, The teacher say, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. We drop down to verse 26. And as they went, and as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which will be shed for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And verse 30 says, And they, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olive. This is the word of God for the people of God. And people say, Thanks be unto God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Just in way of uh, review from last week, we were here all this month. We're going to be talking about healing at the table and the importance of, of, of the Passover leading into communion. We laid out last week the historical um, development of, of Passover, how Passover became the blueprint for what we do today we call communion. So I am convinced in my heart and theologically convinced that there's healing in the elements and what we call communion. So all this week, I want you to be mindful as you're preparing your house, preparing your temple, preparing your body, that when you take um, communion this week and you take communion next week, if your body is wrapped in pain, emotionally, physically, you can begin to say, by his stripes, I am healed. Amen. So let me just begin to say, I didn't put in, last week I touched on it, but I didn't put a lot of emphasis on this. So I want to begin today by saying the first point I want to talk about is to make the house a prayer. Amen. The house of prayer. We came in today, for those that came in early, and my wife was playing the song, uh, The House of Prayer. That is a song in our house. Lord, make me a house of prayer. Make me a house of prayer. I want to see your face. Make me a house of prayer. So to, I want to talk to us about making it physically a house of prayer. Right Several years ago when I was in class, uh, Rabbi Stahl came and gave a presentation about a Jewish faith. And he said something that I still remember to this day. He said that the Christian church is the same as the Jewish home. And he went on to say that the Christians, us, come to church, we do Bible study, we, we do uh, Sunday school, we worship, we pray. He says, we do that as a Jewish nation in our homes. And then we come to church, excuse me, we come to the temple to reinforce what we've already done at a house. And I, I, as he was saying that, and I said, theoretically, we Christians should be doing that too. We should have a house of prayer. And we should pray in the house, not only when we come to church, but we should also pray in our house. We should make our house a house of prayer. And so I want you to be conscious this week. I know we have prayer on the prayer line, but I want us to be conscious this week that you're going to be intentional in making your house a house of prayer. So let me, let me break this down a little further. So the first thing you need to understand, that you are a house of prayer. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me see what, so let me give you a scripture. Because y'all know that 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? 
So if my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, then I am a house of prayer. So the first thing we need to be conscious of, that we are the house of prayer. The second thing I want us to do is to set an atmosphere in your house where prayer is not the stranger. Woo! Set an atmosphere in your house when prayer is not a stranger. Meaning you only pray when there's drama. Then we need to learn how to pray when there's not drama. Amen. I know most some of us are saying, well, I have drama in the house all the time. Well, if that's true, maybe you need to create an atmosphere of prayer so you won't be always confronted with drama. Okay, I'm moving on, I'm moving on. And so we have to be prayer. Now let me also go on and say this. In my home, I can become selfish. No, come on down, come on. Because in my home, I'm praying for my family, I'm praying for me, I'm praying for everything that I need. But when I come to church, which is the third thing, that when I come to church, I need to create, well, let me back up. Not only do I create a place of worship, uh, a place of prayer, I also play, create a place of worship in my house. Amen. Now, when I come to church, there is already an established place of worship. There's already an established place of prayer. So now what I'm doing, what I've done in the home, I now come to the church to reinforce what I've already been doing. But when I come to church this time, it's about corporate prayer, not private prayer. Uh, let me just say that again. I'm not saying that your prayers are not important, but in your home, you can become selfish. But when we come to church, it's about a corporate prayer. We are praying for our communities. We're praying for the world. We're praying for those affected by the pandemic. Over 600,000 people have died during this pandemic, and we need to be praying for their families who are, and friends who have suffered because of loss. This is not time to be selfish. This is time to be corporate-minded. All right, did I just see that? And the fourth thing that you need to do is to understand that in the house of God, there are fellow believers that where we can come and touch and agree. We good? So let me move on to my second point. My second point is called understanding the sacraments. Understanding the sacrament. In many denominations, we use the term sacrament. But I'm not fully sure that we understand what sacraments mean. So I'm going to try and break it down. I heard somebody say, what, is, what does sacrament mean? I'm glad you asked, Elder, Elder Grant. See, I was reading your mind. Sacrament is a Latin term meaning sacramentum, which means a thing set apart as holy. A thing set apart as holy. So when we come to the table, we are taking a sacrament because it is a thing that is set apart as holy. Now, um, back in the, in the year uh, 1069, one of the um, ch early church fathers defined the sacraments like this, an outward and a visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Let me say that again. An outward and a visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, meaning what you see is a visible when we take it, we feel the spiritual grace. We feel God's presence in the sacraments. I get one amen. Okay. Let me see if I can break it down a little further. So a sacrament is an action of the Holy Spirit at work in the body of Christ, the church. That is the masterpiece of God that brings a new and everlasting covenant. A sacrament is the action of the Holy Spirit at work in the body that is the masterpiece of God that brings about a new and everlasting covenant. Let me see what I can break that down a little further. These elements continue to be elements until we give it the meaning. When we pray for it, we make it not just a piece of bread or just a, just a cup. We pray and we make it the body and the blood of Christ. That makes that the action or the masterpiece of God led to the Holy Spirit. I can, I can see our struggle. Let me see if I can make it down a little further. So in the sacraments is a sign that sanctifies us as humans to be able to partake in the body and the blood of Christ. We are, our body's already a temple. 
when we pray, and say, if you have already set the atmosphere of prayer in your house, yeah. when you come here, you are already ready yeah. to receive the sacraments. Yeah. But just in case you're not ready, don't feel worthy, we will pray, and when we pray, we believe that God's grace will touch us and make us worthy. Yeah. All right, okay, praise God. And so it, it builds us as human beings to receive the sacraments. And we arrive at a place we call worship. Okay, I got two amens today. I'm doing, all right, let me see if I work this out. I'm trying to give you a little deeper understanding of what this is, what sacraments mean. I got two amens now. So um, in, in, in the book, the book is called A New Understanding for a New Generation by Ron Noel. And he gives us the development of the word sacrament. He says that when a Roman soldier enters into service in the military to serve the divine emperor or the imperial emperor, he takes a sacred oath that is called a sacrament. Okay, that just went shoom. A Roman soldier entering into the military to serve the emperor takes a sacred oath that he will be loyal, that he will not leave his post, that he will continue to serve the, the emperor, even through hardship. That's called a sacrament, a sacred oath. So when we take the sacrament, we too are taking a sacred oath, that no matter what, we will remain loyal to the commander-in-chief, the king of king, lord of lord, the host of hosts. That one that comes and died on the cross, we will remain well, uh, uh, loyal unto him. And if we should endure hardship, Paul said we should endure hardship as a what? A good soldier because we have already taken the oath and the hardship will not cause us to run away, but to stay because we understand the sacrament is very sacred. Oh, uh, y'all missed that. So when I take this sacrament, I'm also taking an oath not to leave the Lord. All right, okay. When I take the sacrament, I am recognizing consciously that this is the body and the blood of Christ. And when I take it, it is as much as the sacred oath that I take when I stood before the altar and I said, I do. Okay, just, just in case y'all missed that. When we got, for those of us that are married, we took a vow. And that vow is very sacred for those of us who are married. It's very sacred. And, it's, and it will continue to remain sacred as much as we remain it sacred. So when we take the sacrament and we understand the development is a sacred oath that we will not quit, we will continue to be loyal, then we continue to be in the body of Christ. Uh, let, me, let me keep going. So when we come to the table, mm -hmm, we come with an attitude of gratitude, right? We come with thanksgiving. We come with, with understanding that, remember we said that last week, now unto him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in case y'all missed it, go back and look at the YouTube page. Because I wrote down who him is. Sometimes we may not fully understand who him is. So, but the scriptures are now unto him that is able, able. to keep us from falling and to present us yeah. faultless. But when we understand that we also have a part to play in the sacrament called my sacred oath, yeah. that when I come before him, him that is able to keep me, I'm not going to fall because I can't do it by myself. Not by my strength, not by my power, but by the power of the Lord. So it's him that keeps me. So now unto him, that's why I'm able to stand before you. Okay, All right, I'm moving. I got three amen. Y'all doing better. I got three amens now. I got three amens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm standing. I'm standing. Let me try and Pentecostalize this a little bit now. I got I to Pentecostalize it, you know. So Daniel uh, Tumbling, a Pentecostal theologian, has done some excellent work in the area of sacraments. Actually, I want you to go home if you have time. Study this man. The man has done some amazing work. He says we need to understand, as Pentecostals, those who are charismatic in the movement, that first, we are dedicated and consecrated. We are dedicated and consecrated. And secondly, 
we need to have a sacred space. That sacred space is called church. And the sacred space is called church where sacred people come to worship. Woo! Y'all missed that. Y'all missed it. The sacred place is called church and sacred people come to worship. Let me tell you how you, you, how you understand it. We come out here and we say, praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. The very name saints is scripture. By the very nature we use the word saint, we are now saying we are sacred people. Amen. So the church is sacred, the people that come here are sacred, and we have sacred space. Right. So John says, listen to this, I got to, I got to, this blew my mind. It refers to the sacred space as an enchanted space. Ooh! See, now let me, let me say this. When I first read that, I had to like hold up. Would she just say enchanted? So when I think of enchanted, you know, um, I think of cartoons and magic and, and sleeping beauty and Rapunzel in the enchanted world. But she went on and clarified it. She said, it's an enchanted space which is charged atmosphere, charged atmosphere. Right. created by the Holy Spirit. Yes. So the communion of saints. <laughs> She says that this sacred space is an enchanted space that is created by the Holy Spirit. So the, for the communion of saints that will transcend time and space. That is, and then she went on to say this, it's gonna blow your mind. The sacred place offer a therapeutic vision of salvation. The sacred space offers a thera therapeutic vision of salvation. Meaning that when I come here, I'm sick, I'm wounded, I'm broken, I need to be healed. But when I come in the sacred space with sacred people and receive the prayer, the therapeutic vision of salvation happens because sacred people begin to pray. And when the Lord, when sacred people begin to pray that the Lord will have his way, the spirit of the Lord well, come on down. Y'all just, okay, y'all, we sing that. It's coming down, 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 down. Spirit of the Lord is coming down. So when the saints begin to pray, that the Lord would, that's the therapeutic vision that she talks about that brings about healing. All right, y'all, okay. And so, so this is what happens in a Pentecostal community and in communities across the world. Let me get a little bit deeper now. Daniel go, uh, Tomlinson goes on to say, Tomlin, rather, goes on to say that in the Pentecostal charismatic movement, there was a movement towards the altar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me say this. We don't feel like we've been in prayer until we come to the altar. This pandemic challenged us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we have to make altars at home. Yeah. We have to make the altars where you sit. Oh, yeah. But because we have sacred space on, and we are sacred people, Jesus. wherever we are, we can create an altar. Yeah. Hey, come on here. Yeah. So we, we have this movement towards the altar because we believe at the altar is the presence of God. We believe at the altar we have God is visible. Yeah. There's something enchanted <laughs> that happens at the altar. It's not magical, it's mystical. Meaning, it gives room for the Holy Spirit to deal with the sainted people. And here's the, here's the blessing about this. Even when you're not sainted, or don't feel sainted, it's not a barrier for you to come to the, to the, to the altar. Matter of fact, it's an invitation for those to come. Even though you may not feel sainted, you're still welcome at the... Okay, let me go a little deeper. We believe that there's a movement toward the altar and there's a connection between community, uh, between, uh, communion. So we put the communion table at the center. Not just us, many other churches, the communion table at the center. It's a reminder of what the Lord has done. He sacrificed, shed his blood so we can be forgiven. So when we don't feel sainted, 
or saintly, we are reminded that the blood, we can be forgiven. So the focus is not on the preacher. It's on the elements. I may be a vessel, but I'm only a vessel used by God, but the real vessel happens at the... Uh, I'm, 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 trying, I'm going somewhere, I'm going somewhere. Uh, so, so, this is, so we believe this table and this altar is mystical because the Holy Spirit comes and charges it. Okay, let me move on. So we have the sacraments. Let's talk about community. <clears throat> Associated with, with communion is a word called community. The Greek word for community is called koinonia. Kononia is oftentimes referred to as Christian worship in the presence of God. That's true. But I will be giving you an injustice if I leave you with that thought only. Because Kononia is much deeper than that. I'm going to try to de develop it. Many people substitute community with Kononia, and then there's a latest movement to substitute Kononia with fellowship which is okay at the surface level. But if I understand what it means to have true koinonia, it's more than just a, 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 a community. It is a full, intimate community. I'm gonna break it down, because I know I just got y'all just perked up. A full, intimate community or full, intimate unity. Now, how's that mean? What do you mean by that? So, let me see here. So when I come in this house with all of my shortcomings, with all my faults, with all that I have within me that may not be perfect to you, I come in here with people who I am full unity with. And the scripture says, if I am overtaken in the fault, you who love me, you who care about me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You who are spiritual. Yes. You who are saintly people. Yes. Come to me. Not to harm me. Not to blast me. Not to condemn me. Right. But to restore me. Yes, and this is how spiritual saintly people do it. They come with the spirit of meekness. Y'all dismissed it. So when I am in full intimate relationship this thing called koinonia is deeper than a fellowship it's deeper than just a worship it's the place where I come and get healing so when I'm not perfect you see my imperfection but you don't criticize me you come alongside me because you are saintly people and your holy thing that you want to do is to restore me in the spirit of meekness okay let me get a little deeper so when I am in full communion or full intimate relationship I trust you even when I'm hurt by you Oh, uh, but when I am not in full, intimate community, intimate kononia, I get hurt and I form committees. Wow. Let me tell you what committee you form. Here goes the committee. We have the committee. I'm going to combine them into one. The woe is me and the pity party committee. The woe is me and the pity party committee. Why are why they always picking on me? Why they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't understand. I got the Holy Ghost like you got the Holy The woe is me. Then you bring the pity party. There's the people who are going to take your side. You invite them to come to the party. You start complaining, they complain. After you know, everybody complain. And after we all finish complaining, don't nobody like nobody, don't even like the church, we can almost stand God. Because God sometimes lets us down. Oh, he don't know anything, maybe not y'all. So we invite people to the party who we know is going to be on our side. I'm going to tell my story the way I see it. It may not be truthful, and it may not be accurate, but I'm going to tell it to the people who is going to be on my side. Yeah. And they are going to take up my offense. Yes. 
And so whenever I'm mad, whenever I'm mad at the bishop, I'm going to tell them my pity party. And they come to church mad at the bishop. But the bishop ain't done nothing to them. Okay, let me, let me, let me just throw this in for, for good measures. There's usually three things why people get mad at leadership. Ready for this? Y'all should write it down. Y'all should write it down. What leadership did not do, could not do, and would not do. They get mad because what leadership did not do, could not do, would not do. So since I didn't do what you want me to do, you mad. Since I didn't do, couldn't do what you wanted, you mad. And since I wouldn't do what you wanted, you mad. You just mad all around. And then you tell everybody how I hurt your feelings, and they come to church with hurt feelings too, and I never touched them. Never said nothing to them. Let me move on. Let me move on. So the question, the question I have, if you can form the woe is me in the pity party committee, why don't you form the committee I want to be right with God? If you can form the woe is me and the pity party committee, why not form the party that says I want to be right with God? And the right with God has it has a job description that goes with it. It's called Matthew 18. If I have I am offended by my brother, I have the obligation to go to them. Then if that don't work, I take two or three witnesses, not those ones I'm going to invite for my pity party. I'm going to take the elders, the ones that are mature in the world, the ones that don't have a skin in the game, the ones that all the purpose they want to see restoration. And if that don't work, the Bible said you take it to the church. Now, the church can be interpreted in many ways. That could be the bishop, the pastor, the overseer. And the bishop or the pastor, the overseer can say, um, I'm going to form a committee because it's deep. And let's look into this a little deeper. But that's how I want to be right with God means. Not forming the woe is me in the penny, honey. Okay. Okay. I'm going to get a little deeper. Since I'm in a full, intimate relationship, with my wife. Whenever she messes up, I know y'all don't think y'all know I know y'all think she's perfect. I know y'all think she's all that in the bag of chips. And she is. She is, she is, she is. But every now and again, now and then. she messes up. <laughs> now let me, let me let me throw this in for, let me let me throw this in for good measure. When I had to correct my wife, I had to do it this way. Uh, baby, <laughs> I'm putting on my bishop hat, not my husband hat. <laughs> I'm putting on my bishop hat. I got to correct you at the bishop. So once I'm finished correcting her, I said, this is husband hat. The problem is that I don't trans transition. She hasn't. I can't tell you the number of times I'm driven home in the car. Silent night, holy night. <laughs> she get in the house, fix the food, ain't said a word to me. But I'm rest assured before the night is out, we're going to talk. But I, up until then, I got to endure silence. Silence. Silence in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I digress. <laughs> Ooh, I'm just talking the truth. <laughs> so whenever she messes up, right? Uh, I cover her. I don't expose her. I have to be wise. Proverbs 11:30 says, "He that wins souls must be wise." So she, she may mess up, but you will never know, cause it ain't your business. Come on, sir. So when she messes up, I cover her, and I don't humiliate her by making it public. Now, I don't cover it up. I cover. Just like Noah, when Noah was in his mess, his sons walked in backwards and covered him and did not humiliate him or disgrace him. So whenever she messes up, I cover her by not humiliating her or disgracing her because what goes on in the house, or even if it takes place in this house, if it's not life and death, I will never, ever break the covenant that I took at the altar because she saved me too. I just got one amen. Yeah. The problem we have is that many of us don't understand that we are in, a, in this Kulamia community, in a full intimate community, we expose everybody to everything. Yeah. We 
we will never become the full body of Christ by putting out our laundry. Let me put it this way. We, we learned this growing up. You don't air your dirty laundry, right? But man, I air yours if you want to see mine. <laughs> I tell you what, you should be using what tide is it? No, let me move it. Okay. And so, <laughs> so when we form a, <laughs> to form a koinia community, uh, to answer your question, and y'all know I'm retired military. I like acronyms. We got to use the word HAT, H-A-T. We have to be hospitable. Uh, hospitable is sharing what we have with one another. You go back and understand that in the book of Acts, the hospitable community, the coordinated community, they helped each other. We came close to that in that freeze. Yeah. Neighbors were out without water, without food, yeah. and neighbors kicked in, and we, we saw what it could look like. But why do we have to wait until there's a disaster for us to become the community? So, so we had it to be hospitable, right? Um, a acceptance. We have to learn to accept people where they are. I, I wish Sister Cheryl was Sister Cheryl was here. She's not here today. Um, Y'all know Sister Cheryl got tattoos all over the place. And I remember inviting her to the church. She said, "You think they're gonna talk about me, my tattoos?" I said, "Let them talk. Cause if I catch them, I'm gonna say something to them." Because if we can't accept her and her tattoos, we need to close our doors. We have to learn how to accept people where they are. We want them to change so they walk in the door. And they help you out. Them tattoos ain't going nowhere. Right? I had to evolve. Because I came out of the old church. You don't put no stuff on your... Okay. Mm. <laughs> I have evolved. I don't have no tattoo, no. <laughs> I haven't evolved that much. <laughs> but I'm not judging your tattoos anymore. Amen. Come, can I get an amen? amen? In the old church, I would have, I thought I would have judged you walked in the door. Oh, Lord. But people with tattoos love the Lord just so much as you love the Lord. Oh my God, okay, I'm just using tattoos. It can be a whole bunch of other issues. All right, so A is acceptance. T is togetherness. Or together oneness. We have to learn how to, co to coexist in a community together. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we have to find ways to come together, as you were talking about in Sunday school. Listen, we can form small group communities. You don't have to wait to come to church as long as you do it in the right spirit. I don't have to be there at every community. If I trust you, elders, well, you're an elder because I trust you. Form some community. Call one another. Invite one another to come out and get up. Well, now we can at least eat together, at least a little bit. All right, let me move on. Now, this is what y'all been waiting for, the four cups. The four cups. I know I laid it out last week in the Jewish community. In the Passover, they have four cups. Jesus took one cup. Now, it, it is, uh, in all the Gospels, he says, and Jesus took the cup. Now, it, it kind of incites that there was one cup. But if there was Jewish community, there were four cups. Now, just because the other cups are not mentioned, it doesn't mean that the other cups are not there. But the one cup that is mentioned is one that Jesus gave new meaning to. And let me develop it. Okay? Uh, so the scripture we read today in Matthew said, and Jesus took the cup and blessed it, right? The cup. So I'm going to give you this, this historical and then a theological to go with the cups. So the four cups come out of the, what we call, I will passage, which is from Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. The four cups come from the I will passage, which is from Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. You have to go back and read it by yourself. <sighs> which is linked to the Christian community. I'm going to try to lay it out the best I can. So the first cup is the cup called the Kaddish cup or the cup of sanctification. That's what that we Christianize it. We call it the cup of sanctification. That is a cup, listen to this, that that cup is mixed with water and wine. 
I just knocked at your door and you just went, huh? Okay. The first cup is called a Kaddish cup or the cup of sanctification. It's mixed with water and wine. It represents it represent a separation from bondage onto freedom and is sanctified for God's purpose. Mm -hmm. it's, Exodus says, I will take you out. That's part of the I will. So let me give you the, the theological. This is the Cliff Note version. I said the cup is mixed with what? Water? Uh huh. Okay. When Jesus is on the cross, a Roman soldier comes by, pierced him in the side. What well, came out? Water and wine. Water, blood. Well, yeah, well, okay. It, it comes wine later on. Okay. <laughs> water. Y'all listening. Y'all listening. It's water and blood. Blood is for the what? The washing of the sins. And the water is for what? The baptism. Woohoo! In the Catholic Church, when the priest gets ready to prepare the communion cup, he takes a little bit of water and pours it into the wine to follow tradition. But he's also saying that this is the birth of the church. Accident is the physical manifestation of the church. But the birth of the church happened on the cross. Oh, Y'all missed it. We need blood for the washing of the sin, water for the baptism. Church is already born at the cross. Y'all just said that so lightly. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot. I taught that last year. <laughs> I taught that last year. No wonder y'all just so lightly. So it happens, right? So the first cup is a cup of sanctification. So what we see in the cup is that it's mixed with water. We are sanctified. I will bring you out unto the Lord. Second cup is called a cup of judgment. This is I will. I will deliver you from bondage. During this Passover, the Father will begin to um, initiate a prayer. And he will tell of the journey from, from Egypt, from slavery to uh, freedom. But the oldest child would ask the question, Father, why is this night different from any other night? That's been handed down for centuries. It started at the first Passover, and they keep asking the same question, why is this night? any different from any other night and the father will recant the story of how they were in bondage but how the Lord delivered them and passed judgment remember the blood on the doorpost meant those that were covered by the blood was free but those that were not covered ex judgment of death All right, so let me move on because I don't want to get caught up there but then the father will recite from Deuteronomy 26 5 through 11. That's how he answers the child. Deuteronomy 5, uh, 26, 5 through 11. Read that at home. But afterwards, you are reflecting on the story of how God brings you out from bondage and sets you free. Leads you to the third cup. The third cup is called a cup of redemption. This marks the official start of the Passover meal. Because after they drink this cup, this is when they eat from the lamb. Now remember now, the lamb is Jesus, right? Y'all have to really go back and look at last week, mirror the two together. When they begin to eat, the scripture I brought out last week, that they came out with silver and gold, and there was no feeble among them. So that means they may have been sickly while they were eating, but when they left, they came out healed. They eat the lamb while in the third cup. And it says that Jesus, that God says, um, I will redeem you with my outstretched arm with great judgment. Let me see if I break this down. The lamb, the Jewish word for the lamb is zero, zero far, meaning arm. So when you eat from the arm, it's the representation of God, outstretched arm, that reaches out to us and brings us back to himself. In other words, God is reclaiming that was already his. Let me get to the fourth cup. I'm almost, almost finished. Let's get to the fourth cup, the Hillel cup. This is usually done by singing from Psalms 115 through 118. 
This is a community that sings. This is a community not just praise, but they can't, they sing. And this is part, this is the, I, I will, I, I will, I will take you for my people and I will make you, I will be your God. The four I wills, right? Now, so this, I'm gonna get this, this cup of, is where we're gonna hang our hat for a little while. So this, this, this cup is also known as a cup of consummation. The cup of consummation. Now I gotta break that down for you. Because I thought I knew what it was until I, up, until I looked up in the dictionary. It says, listen to this, a fulfillment and an outcome and or marks of arrival of something. A fulfillment or an outcome or a mark of arrival of something. So when they take this cup, it is the consummation that something is about to happen. It's, it's the, the affirmation that something is about to happen. So when Jesus takes the cup, he takes the cup of consummation. How do I know that's the cup this way? Because after they finished taking it, they went out singing. That is the last cup. And traditionally, once you take this cup, you go out singing. So Jesus takes this cup, the cup of consummation, and he says something that is, that is fantastic. He said, this is the cup. Well, excuse me, the scripture said he takes the cup. He went from four cups to one cup. Now, I'm going to put it all together, right? Jesus takes one cup and merges all cups into one. Why? Because he is all four in one. Okay, <laughs> let's see if I can break this down, right? Jesus is the, the cup of sanctification. He sanctifies it unto himself. He is the cup of judgment. He will deliver us from bondage. He is the cup of, uh, of redemption because he will redeem us with his outstretched hands. We can help. Well, okay, there's, there's, there's one scripture we all should know this. John 3, 16. What is this? What John 3, 16? So God loved the world that he does what? That is his outstretched hand in love for everybody. And the last cup is a cup of consummation because he has consumed everything all in one because he now makes this statement that what have you been looking for has arrived. That what you have been waiting for has arrived. He merged all four cups into one. So when we come to the table, we don't need four cups. We need one because the one that has been, we've been waiting for has arrived. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to close. And so when we come to the table, we come expecting a healing. We come expecting a blessing. We come whatever ailment we have is wrapped up in the table. It's wrapped up in one. And Jesus says, I paid it all. Okay. Just in case you need a reason to celebrate, I'm, I'm, we're going to go to the table. In case you need a reason to celebrate, Isaiah 53 and says, what does it say? 53 and 5 says, he was what? Wounded for our transgression. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace is upon us. And guess what? By his stripes we're healed. So when we come to the table all of this month, I'm telling you, we will be having communion. We started not just on first Sunday. It will go next week. It will go till the end of this month. And tell, let me tell you something. I'm not sure if we don't continue because the Lord ain't released me. It may go another month before we could move on into what church is going to look like. Let's get healed so we can get into the next level, so we can be ready for what God has for us. Some of you have experienced some losses this year, and maybe as a pastor, we can't move on till we acknowledge your loss. Some of you have come to the table wounded, bruised, and abused. But when you come to this table, we come expecting a blessing because the law says, I am your cup sanctification. I am your judgment cup. I am your redemption cup. And I am your consummation cup. All right, I, listen. Oh, well, I went past my time. That's a new thing I got to get used to. <laughs> Consuming time into one. No longer two hours, y'all. Woo! If you want to see the announcement, go to the page. All right. Terry, you're going to fix this thing. It's okay. Listen, um, Elder Greg, did you, did you get a communion cup when you came in? Will somebody give him a cup? 
listen, we can't do communion yet, just yet like we used to. Like we used to. Like we used to. But we're going to sit down for a moment. You're going to sing the song they did last week? Y'all yeah, prepared to sing the song? Oh, yeah, this song. Okay. We're going to sit down for a moment. We're not going to the table yet. We're going to meditate for a moment. See, one of the things about a Pentecostal, we move too fast sometimes. We feel we, we, everything got to be like this. But sometimes we got to stop and slow it down. So give you time to. I, I said a lot today. I said a lot last week. Some of y'all are still chewing. You haven't digested yet. So we're going to give you time to digest. Listen to the words of the song as we prepare to commune with God. We're not going to be walking, coming up. But you have the communion already. Remember, your body is a temple. We're going to create that atmosphere as prayer. My house shall be a house of prayer. And as a t where you are a temple, so where you are is your sacred space. So your space is sacred, you're sacred, and we're going to consecrate these elements and they'll be sacred. Is good. So when Jesus was betrayed, when Jesus Let us was stand. betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. Father, bless this bread. Blessed Jesus. Make this bread to be your body, yeah. broken and bruised for us. Yeah. And by your stripes, by your stripes. We, are we are healed. And so when we consume this bread, no matter what state of mind we're in, no matter the physical body that we may be in, we believe that by your stripes we are healed. So after he blessed it, he broke it. He said, take and eat. Likewise, he took the cup. And he blessed the cup. 
So, Father, we thank you for the blood that you shed for us on Calvary's cross, God. Thank you for the reminder that there's power in your blood, there's healing in your blood. God, as we consume this, we thank you for what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Listen, Wednesday night, join us on our Zoom for our Bible study. Oh, Minister Lavera will, will be preaching. Praise the Lord. Woo! Join us on our regular Zoom night for Le Minister Lavera Clark. <laughs> See, we'll be preaching. Tonight at 6, join me. I will be doing for Words for the Soul. I have four special guests. Uh, Y'all had to join on to catch on who they are. Very, very important that you join us. And Tuesday and Thursday, prayer on the phone at 1 o'clock. Well, Tuesday, 1 o'clock. Thursday at 8.30. Yes, and on Thursday we'll be and on Thursday, we want to be praying. We ask you to gather the family. Remember family prayer? We ask you to call your family, your children, your grandchildren, have them get on the phone, and we're going to be doing some family praying on Thursday. So please join us for that. We praise God for everyone that has tuned in. And if you have not had a chance to like and share the play page, do so. I tell you, this word needs to go out to so many. This was, was a, a dynamic word, and we are praise God for what God is doing. And you can go to our YouTube channel on True Vine Church. Church SA, and you can pick up last week's message, and then this week, subscribe to the page too. And this week's message will be on there a little later on today. But thank God for each of you, and those who joined us at home, thank you. I know this we're still trying to figure out what church is going to look like, who's going to be here. But I'm, one thing I'm I am not concerned about is numbers anymore, right? Because it's not a numbers game anymore. We still, still have COVID restrictions, so we can only gather but so many to be safe. 